how many altars did Abraham build? When we start talking about, let's see, next week we're going to start talking about Isaac, and then we're going to, I think we're going to do chapter, anyway. But when you study Isaac, he basically is famous because he dug wells. When we get to Jacob, he's basically famous because he built pillars. And there, my translation says pillar. They're sort of like historical markers <laughs> or stained glass windows with somebody's, something important happened here. That's Jacob, the rascal. Abraham is famous for building altars. Everywhere he went. At Shechem, at Bethel, and Hebron, we've seen those, whether or not you remember it. But tonight, he built an altar like no other altar. And he was an old man and remembered a lot of places where he had made sacrifices. But what God asked him to do at Moriah was like, oh my goodness, I thought I was living a surrendered life. I thought I was walking before God and be thou perfect. And now suddenly God's asked me to do something that I, didn't, I, I don't even have categories to deal with it. So this is Abraham's finest hour. If I could say it like Winston Churchill, I would. Uh, and his defining moment. I think we're just going to read it first and then we're going to uh, talk about it. Genesis 22. Um, and if I'm reading the story of Abraham right, this is the point tonight. This is the reason God called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. This is the point of his life. And he's probably 125 or 130 years of age. He's been following the Lord, fully surrendered, I think, since he was 75. Yes. And he's lived an impressive life, but this is his final exam. After these things, God tested Abraham. Now, I think the King James Version says God tempted. And I'm no scholar, but I want to be bold to say that's a bad translation. God does not tempt anybody. According to James, James, that's a New Testament quote. God tempts no one. Uh, but the word is the word test. We're going to talk in a moment, what's the difference between a test and a temptation? I am so glad you asked. Very important question. After these things, God tested Abraham. After what things? I'm sorry I'm pausing. Mainly last week after he had to let go of Ishmael. Abraham had two sons, remember last? And it broke his heart. His wife got upset, kicked the slave woman out, kicked the, her kid out. And God said, though, Ab though Sarah has some heart issues <laughs> uh, and probably is dealing with hate and favoritism, her instincts are actually right. So he, he says goodbye to Ishmael, who he loved. Now, there's one son left. After these things, God tested Abraham and said, Abraham? And he said, here am I. And the here am I is sort of like at your service. It's sort of like, it's a, it's a term in the Bible that I won't explore with you tonight, but it's a good one. Verse 2. God said, take your son, your only son. You only have one son, Abraham. And I can hear Abraham saying, no, I don't. I've, what about Ishmael? Your only son, the son of the covenant. Isaac. And what does Isaac mean? Laughter. The child that brought joy and laughter back into your home. Take your son, your only son, laughter, the one you love. And if my research is correct, this is the first time the word love is used 
in sacred scripture. That just breaks my heart right there. And God uses it to say to an old man about his son, that's the one I want. And offer him to me as a, excuse me, did I leave out? And go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a, what? Burnt offering. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. The Hebrew word is the word ola or hola. Anybody know what that's the origin of? Holocaust. That's right. Make, turn Isaac into a holocaust. I, I've, I've, one of the books I read this week is Eli Wiesel, who's a Jewish atheist, I think, but he writes a chapter on Ab the binding of Isaac. And he makes a point. He came out of Auschwitz. His story will break your heart. If you know, he was, won the Nobel Prize or the, for Literature Peace Prize, I think. Um, but he makes the point, Isaac was a holocaust. And every Jew's story is found in this story. Since this point. It's like, whoa, you got my attention. Um, Okay, I'm sorry for my comments. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah. Offer him as a holocaust on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. So Abraham said, can we talk about this? <laughs> when God told Abraham he was going to destroy Sodom, Abraham stood in God's way and said, what if there's 50 righteous? Won't the God of all the earth do just? Won't the judge of all? Now, he doesn't say a thing. He doesn't protest. He rose early, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, don't you wish you knew what they talked about for three days? Um, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy, some translations say the lad. We're going to talk about Isaac's age in a little bit. But uh, we'll go over there and we will what? What's your definition of worship? And I think this is the first use of the word worship in Scripture. A lot of people get excited about worship, and I just want to say let's define worship by starting with Genesis 22. Let's go and worship, and then we'll come again to you. He knows he was told to sacrifice Isaac, but he tells his servants, we'll be back. And a lot of just, what's going on here? It's just, this is, so, this is such sacred ground. You almost want to whisper. You just say, wow, what's... And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac. Isaac is carrying the wood up the mountain. And if you have an image of John chapter 19 where John says, and Jesus carried his cross. You're thinking right. That's the right way to think. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they both of them went together. Verse 7. And Isaac said to his father, My father. And he said, Here I am at your service. Behold the fire and the wood. Where's the lamb for the Holocaust? And Abraham said, Not I'll find a lamb. God's going to have to provide the lamb, my son. 
Don't look to me for the lamb. And think about all that Abraham knows. Look to God for the lamb. I don't think Isaac ever forgot those words. Look to God for the lamb. Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? Um, Verse 8. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both went together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar and laid the wood in order on it and bound Isaac. He was probably 20 to 25 years of age. I mean, that's my estimation. A lot of debate on this. Uh, The Jews call this story the binding of Isaac. That's how it's known in the binding of, and it comes right here. So Abraham binds his son, laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, twice repeated his name. And he said, at your service, it's so moving. Uh, He said, don't lay your hand on the boy. Don't do anything to him. Now I know. I've been watching you for about 35 years. But now I know you fear God. I want to say, I, I just, it's, I'm trying to be quiet. <laughs> Seeing you've not withheld your son, your only son. Verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a lamb. He had, God had said, I'll provide a lamb, but he didn't. He provided the father of the lamb. Just think of these words. I'd never understood that until this, one of the commentators said, why a ram? And he just said, a ram, by definition, is a lamb's father. Who's getting sacrificed? The, the, the son or the father? That's a great question. That's a great question. I love the way you're listening to this. Um, Caught in a thicket by his horn. Uh, And and notice, God, I don't think, miraculously created a ram called, I have the impression the ram was always there. But Abraham could only see God's provision when he had come to the point of full surrender. Then he said, well, for heaven's sake, look what God's provided. Everything about this story is powerful. Um, And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Verse 14. So Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. Uh, the Lord will provide. Yahweh Jireh, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abram, Abraham a second time and said, By myself I have sworn. Up until this time God has said to Abraham, I promise But now he adds something. He said, I'm not just making a promise to you. I swear, cross my heart, hope to die. Sort of, I'm making an oath. Hold on to that thought. Um, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you've done this and have not withhold your son, your only son, I will bless you. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven as the sand on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. 
And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. That is an amazing story. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. Let me just start through this. It just helps me. This is how I've organized my thoughts. Um, Abraham, Abraham. Do you remember growing up when your mother or maybe your father would cause you, call you by your name twice? Stanley, Stanley. Uh, I mean, I can still hear it. It, it, the, the, the repetition was significant. Something either good or bad usually was going on. I had either just won a reward, well, Stanley, Stanley. Usually an ad my middle name would, would you know, or, or I'd done something naughty. If you want a very interesting study or a great series of mess, I've never preached this message, this series, but I want to find the places. There's about eight in Scripture where God calls somebody by their name twice. He did it to Abraham here on the mountain. Abraham, Abraham, don't kill the boy. Now I know. Let me give you the list. This this will move you. Jacob, Jacob, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. At the burning bush, Moses, Moses, not once. And if I, you, you need to be a dramatist to know how to get the intonation right. Take off your shoes. You are on the holy land. You're not in Israel. But this Sinai Peninsula is part of the holy land now. Why? Because it's part of Israel? No. Because God's there. Samuel, Samuel, Samuel's a boy in the temple and he has this dream. Samuel, Samuel. And then God says, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. I'm going to destroy. And he's telling, how old is Samuel? Seven or eight years old? Simon, Simon. And he calls Peter by Peter's old name. Pete means rock. He doesn't say rock. He says his old name, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you. Or when Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And it's that second one, the drama of it. How often I've longed to gather you as children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing, and now your house will be left desolate. These walls will be torn down and the temple will be rubble. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? My favorite, Martha, Martha. It breaks my heart when he says it. You were anxious and fretting about so much. Martha, Martha. And you can hear the, feel the love in his voice. We're on the cross when Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Was that? But my God, my God. But those are just the double words. So Abraham, Abraham. Few chapters in the Bible equal Genesis 22 in importance. For agnostics and cynics, it confirms their worst fears. God is cruel, capricious, egotistical, irrational, and guilty of child abuse. And I promise you that's what people say about this chapter. Uh, Those words, uh, divine child abuse, I've heard on more than one. People say, yeah, that's the God you worship. He abuses children. And they turn to Genesis 22. Is that what's going on? But for those who have eyes to see, this chapter is one of the clearest presentations of the gospel ever written. And this is about 2000 B.C. (laughs) And we're talking about good news. 
Here we are on holy ground. And I think we've already felt it. Um, I'll skip my footnotes, but you can read them. The place is holy, number one. Where is Mount Moriah? Anybody know? Anybody? If you look in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, it says Solomon built his temple. We're talking about Jerusalem uh, on Mount Moriah. So it's where the temple was. It's where Jerusalem was. When Abram, Abraham and Isaac went there, apparently it was just uninhabited. This was centuries before there was a city there, a fortress there, a temple there. And of course, just beyond Mount Moriah is Mount Calvary. So th but this is where maybe the very location where the altar of burnt offering was in the temple. Uh, that's the place. So the place is holy. Mount Moriah and the region around it is uninhabited, but centuries later, this will be the site of Solomon's temple. Far more than Mount Sinai, this mountain, Moriah, the place of worship, sacrifice, substitution, the Lamb, will be the most holy place for the people of God. Um, I think Pharisees, if you would have said, what's the most important mountain? They would, meet, as a knee-jerk reaction, say, Sinai, Sinai. That's where the fire fell and the law was given, the Torah. And, but centuries before Sinai, we have Moriah. The persons are holy. Abraham and Isaac. And let me just give you shorthand here. Abraham is all about what it means to be a father. Isaac is all about what it means to be a son. And I'm not sure which role is harder. <laughs> They both have a very difficult assignment. To be a father is hard. To be a son is hard in very different ways. And so we've got this picture of Abraham, Isaac. We're going to soon meet a grandson named Jacob and then a great-grandson named Joseph. So don't leave Tuesday night. By, don't move to Brazil. We're just getting warmed up, Mel and Fran. Um, so Abraham and Isaac, the patriarchs, are for the people of God. Their beliefs and their actions set the standard for what it means to be a child of the covenant and what it means to be a father and what it means to be a son. Uh, number three, the action is holy. This chapter, set at the beginning of the story of salvation told in the Bible, introduces us to concepts that are foundational to spiritual wholeness. Faith, sacrifice, worship, substitution, parenting, being a father, being a son. It doesn't get more basic than that. And turn to Genesis 22 for those questions. We doing okay? Roman numeral 2. Some brief com commentary. Uh, just a few comments on what we've read. A, this is a test. Verse 1, God tested Abraham. It is important to distinguish between a test and a temptation. <clears throat> the purpose of a temptation is sinister. To make someone stumble and fall. If you tempt someone, you're, you're hoping you can make them fall. God never does that. God does test. Satan tempts, but God never tempts. When you're on the receiving end, I don't know if you've ever said this and gone, gone through something really hard, and you say, now, did God send that or did Satan send that? <laughs> did God do that to me so he could strengthen me? Or did Satan do that to me hoping I would fall. Because when you're on the receiving end, they feel sort of like the same thing. 
But it's very important theologically to distinguish. God does not want me to fall. If it's a temptation, it is from the pit. If it's a test, it's from God. And God tests us the same reason our school teachers tested us. Yeah, okay. Number two, God often tests or proves, tries, disciplines, educates His children. I've given you a footnote with an introduction to just get your uh, Strong's Concordance and look up the word test. It's, it's a real rich study. Um, he does this not because he is sadistic, but to reveal their true character, which is, I think, the purpose of Abraham's test. Now I know you fear God. No doubt about it. In fact, the whole world knows you fear God. You've not withheld your son, your only son. To burn away what is impure, Peter talks about tests as a furnace in which metals are put to burn away the dross so what comes out is pure gold. That's what's happening in a test. And third, to prepare for the journey ahead. It proves you, it equips you to reveal, to burn away, to prepare. Number three, the text is clear that God is testing the depth of Abraham's trust or faith. Do you trust me? Do you trust me when I tell you to do something that sounds irrational, illogical, incomprehensible, even immoral? Um, Okay, now I know that you fear God. Although Abraham had already trusted God to the extent that he had left everything and stepped out into the unknown in obedience, he had never been tested like this. I'm getting to that stage of life where I say to God fairly often, okay, I've done all the hard stuff. <laughs> That's all behind me. And I look in the mirror of, and think, no, I, the Lord, you, it's, you've done some amazing things. Now I'm going to coast. I, I, can't we just move to Florida and play shuffleboard for the next th two decades? When I pray like that, God, does, he just looks at me and just says, I'm not even going to respond to that. Uh, that was funny to me. It wasn't to you. <laughs> Letter B, each word of Genesis 22-2 seems intended to press home the reality to drive deeper the knife. Your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Offer him, letter C, as a burnt offering. The Hebrew term ola, and I think it's an aspirated O, a hola, is the origin of the English word holocaust. Leviticus 1 explains that this offering, the burnt offering, the Holocaust, is totally consumed by the flames on the altar. If you remember in Le Leviticus, if you've ever actually read the book, it's, uh, it's challenging. But most of the offerings were like divided up. Okay, the priests get the, the, the meat and they get to eat it. Part of it's burned, or part of it's given to the poor. But, but the burnt offering, the holocaust, the whole offering was put on the altar, and the whole thing was burnt. It was a whole burnt offering. That's what Isaac was to be. Uh, by flames on the altar, it is literally turned to smoke and ashes. Leon Koss formulates God's question to Abraham in these terms. Will you walk reverently and wholeheartedly before God? Remember, walk before me and be perfect. That was two weeks ago. Okay, Abraham, will you walk before me wholeheartedly, even if it means sacrificing all the benefits promised from such conduct? 
Do you fear and revere God more than you love your son? And through him, your nation, your name, your prosperity? Do you love me or do you love my gifts? What if there were no blessings? Would you still trust me? And I think Abraham said, I've never thought about that. <laughs> and I think God said, well, I want you to think about it really deeply. Letter D. When God announced his plans to destroy Sodom, Abraham pleaded with God. Remember the session on intercession? But here, Abraham says nothing. He rises early, saddles his donkey, donkey and promptly obeys. Apparently, he knew that on this matter, there was going to be no discussion. According to Hebrews 11, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, but he obeyed. And I just threw in here the serenity prayer. Grant me, God, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, the wisdom to know the difference. That's a really good prayer. When he was confronted with Sodom, Abraham said, I'm going to challenge you on this, God. I don't, I'm going to stand in your way and we're going to talk this out, but with, not with Isaac. Letter D, God stops Abraham from killing his son. Though we know that God is adamantly opposed to child sacrifice. I've got some footnotes there. That's real important to insist on that. He lets the drama play out to the last second before he intervenes. As a substitute for Isaac, God provides a lamb. Technically, God provided a ram. And like I said, it was only about two days ago that I actually thought about that. What's the father of a lamb? Apparently, the ram had been there all along. But Abraham was able to see it only after he had come to the point of full surrender. That just makes me pause and think. Abraham named the place Yahweh Jehovah Jireh. Letter F. Once Abraham has passed the test, God renews the covenant promises. God will bless Abraham, give him innumerable descendants, like sand, like stars, and make him a blessing to the nations. But this time, he's, he's renewed this promise to Abraham three or four times. In, since chapter 12. It just gets renewed. He does it again. This time he adds something new. And the book of Hebrews catches this and underscores it. He confirms the covenant promise with an oath. He doesn't just say, I promise you. He says, I, I swear. I give you my word. I give you my oath. By myself, I have sworn. And this is what Hebrews says. Very interesting comment. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincing, convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is possible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement. So what are the two things that God is telling us? This is why you can count on my word. By two unchangeable, this is not scripture, this is Stan's parentheses. I had to actually think about this. What are the two unchangeable things? His promise and his oath. He says, I promise, and he says, I swear. And the book, the book of Hebrews says, 
I think we can count. If God tells us something, I think we can trust him. And God only swore to keep his promise after Abraham's binding of Isaac. Then he said, you have my solemn oath, Abraham. You can count on this. Okay, we're doing actually very good on time. I'm watching our time. I, uh, well, let me just read you my first paragraph, a text for medication. Uh, medication. <laughs> That's, that was a Freudian slip, wasn't it? Though I love to preach hard-hitting sermons on full surrender. I went to, back and looked in my file, and I've got a few sermons where I just let it all out, preaching on Abraham and is your all on the altar kind of sermon. And I, I thought about doing that to you sweet people tonight, but I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm compromising anything, but I just that's not how I'm reading it this time. Though I love to preach hard-hitting sermons on full surrender from Genesis 22, Tonight, it's just where I'm at, I feel constrained to take a more contemplative approach. Let's, it, I just feel this is such a holy passage. I don't, I just want to be meditative. Let's prayerfully absorb the deep meaning of this story from the perspective of the three main characters. All right? So this is my message tonight. Let's think about what Abraham lived through. Let's think about what Isaac lived through, letter B. And then let's think about what God is going through. All right? And not so much a study. Let's just sort of say, Holy Spirit, help me to get this. Are you with me? And my... I think one of my questions is, are you identifying tonight more with Abraham or with Isaac? That's, and I'm, okay. Abraham, put yourself in his sandals. I was going to say shoes, and then I put delete. I said, no sandals. And imagine what he's thinking. And I think of... Uh, Soren Kierkegaard, which is a very hard person to read, but he's got a book called Fear and Trembling. And the whole book is about Genesis 22. And uh, it's, it's deep and over my head. But um, he says about the three days they walked that it took them to get to Moriah. He says those three days for Abraham were as long as the 3,000 years it's been since that event to now. He wrote that in about 1860 or something. But just that, the, what, what was Abraham thinking? One, think again on Abraham's walk of faith prior to this moment, how he had left everything, trusting in the promises of God. God, I gave you Ur of the Chaldees. I gave you my family. I gave you my mom and dad. I gave you my possessions. I left for a land and a people I'd never heard. I trusted you in the famine. I trusted you in Egypt. What more do you want? And I think, I don't know if you've ever said that to God, but there's been a number of, I said, I've, I've been doing the stuff. <laughs> and God just says, Isaac. Number two, think again about how Abraham had fathered Ishmael. Remember the study we had on how to birth a donkey. Ishmael was a donkey of a man. That's what the scripture says. It was the result, the child of flesh. Doing God's will, man's way. And Abram had watched Ishmael grow and become a donkey of a man. I tried to do your will my way, God, and I actually love Ishmael. I, and then you gave me the child of promise. Number three, 
Think of the mind-boggling, breathtaking, heart-stopping command. Take your only son, the one you love so much, the one named Laughter, and make a holocaust of him. Turn him to smoke and ashes. I, I, now, just help me. Describe what do you think he's feeling? What questions is he asking? Just give me some words. Talk to me a little bit. Horror. Horror. What else? Confusion. Confusion. Yeah. Really, God? Did I get that right? Would you repeat that? This is the child of promise. There's no covenant without Isaac. There's no future. Kierkegaard says what Abraham sacrificed on the altar was rationality. <laughs> I'm not sure he's right, but I like, I like where he's going. He just said, this doesn't make sense. And that faith is this leap into the unknown. This is Kierkegaard, and he's a philosopher, and the father of existentialism, among other things. But he loved Jesus, and he loved the truth, and he loved the scriptures. But he just said Abraham was being asked to sacrifice his reason and to live by blind faith, basically. I don't like that answer, but he's certainly confused. What else? No, thank you. Yeah, it's like, really, God? I, 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 this is too personal, maybe, but I, we moved here seven years ago when Katie's dad was, what, 89? And we watched him the last five, six years of his life. But he was still fighting battles and making sacrifice. I mean, he was involved in all kinds of stuff. I mean, I would just sort of watch him. And he never seemed to say that. He never seemed to say, are you kidding? I mean, I say it all the time. <laughs> I've got 40 years to go, according to him. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's, I get that question. What else? Give me, what's he feeling? Hard. Hurt. Yeah. Apparently, he didn't talk to Sarah about it. Good choice. Uh, and that's one of the questions that's sort of, I'm dying to know, what, when did she discover what was going on? And what did she think? Um. Let me just keep moving. Uh, Abraham obeyed. He believed. He put his all on the altar. He got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and did it. He thus became a hero of the faith and set the standard once and for all for what it means to believe in God. I mean, this, this is what it means to walk by faith. To surrender, to surrender, to sacrifice. Uh, this is Kierkegaard. L just listen to this guy. Uh, Abraham was great with that power whose strength is powerlessness. He was great in that wisdom whose secret is folly. <laughs> He was great in that hope whose outward form is insanity. And he was great in that love which is hatred of self. I can't understand Abraham. I can only admire him. I just, I love those words. Um, all right. Abraham. Let's talk about Isaac. It's hard to be a father 
But it's also hard to be a son. That just sort of makes me pause right there. Yep. And I'm old enough. I've been on both sides of that equation. And uh, I get that. Put yourself in Isaac's sandals and imagine what it must have been like. Number one, Isaac was old enough. And you can read the commentaries, but usually the ages are between 18 and 30. I think the Jewish Midrash says he was 35. I mean, it's, but he wasn't a six-year-old kid. He was old enough to understand what was happening. Dad, where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? He, he's, and he's got three days to think about it. He's not stupid. And he's old enough to either run away. It wouldn't be hard to out, if you're 18 to outrun a 130-year-old man or to stop him. What are you doing with that knife, Dad? I can, I can handle you. I can take you down. That's right. Isaac, number two, was no victim. Oh, my goodness. He was a willing sacrifice. And the binding of Isaac, it's, it's, I see it like I see when they nailed nails into Jesus' hands. I suspect Roman soldiers, when they nailed a man to a cross, had to take a hand that was fighting everything they did and tie that hand down and, you know, get two or three men on the arm to hold it still. I think when it came to Jesus, Jesus said, there's my hand. You are not taking my life. I'm giving my life. And I think that's Isaac. Dad, I'm not sure I understand what's going on here. I certainly don't like it, and I'm pretty afraid, but you're my father. What are my options here? He's no victim. Number three, the passage is not just about what it means to be a father. Just as importantly, it's about what it means to be a son. Is that what the sacrament of circumcision was all about? What does it mean when we stand before the church and everybody's smiling and it's all so cute and we dedicate babies to the Lord? I'll tell you what it means if I understand scripture. And whether we use water or not depending on the traditions we come from, baptism or dedication. But when we say, God, we're giving you our children, it means you're putting them on an altar. You're sacrificing them. Tell me if I'm wrong on that. <laughs> Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, number four, in answer to his question about the lamb, Abraham said, God will provide a lamb. He didn't say, your daddy will provide the lamb. Isaac would always remember that his father taught him to put his trust not in his father, but in his father's God. This is, and it's like my mind is just racing when I say these words. Did I do that with my kids? Yes, it does. And, and uh, Eugene Peterson renders that. God sees to it. Okay. God will provide. God sees to it. Interesting. That's very good. Good. Number five, Isaac learned an amazing lesson. Though his father loved him with passionate devotion, his father loved God more. Do our children know that? I'd take a bullet for my kids. Do they know? I would do anything for my kids, but if I have to choose between kids and God, 
He's God, they're not. Do they know that? Do they understand that? Because if they don't understand that, when they grow up like Isaac and have a kid like Jacob, oh my goodness, this is where the plot gets really interesting. Jacob, are you learning your lessons? Because you're about to be a father. I don't know a better psychology book than the book of Genesis. Uh, number six, Isaac is just as much a hero of the faith as is his father. Imagine yourself as Isaac during the three-day walk with Abraham to Moriah. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Give me some quick answers. What's that? Apprehension. What's going on here? Where's the lamb? Aren't you going to tell me? Why don't you talk to me, Dad? What's going on with God? What kind of a God would give a test like this? That is a good question. Mm -hmm. And if your first response, is he cruel, capricious, irrational? Or is there more going on than is going on? And let me just tell you, there's more going on than is going on. Number one, it is important, it is impossible, excuse me, it's impossible to miss the foreshadowing of Calvary. If you want to say Mount Calvary, like Mount Moriah, and I, the two mountains are within eyesight, I mean they're really one location. And the altar and the temple and the sacrifice going on on Calvary. The foreshadowing of Calvary and the drama played out on the neighboring mountain. All right. um, Abraham and Isaac are not the only father-son team involved. And just listen to the foreshadowing. Thank you, Gary. Bless your brother. Isaac carried the wood up the mountain. You cannot tell me that when John, in chapter 19, verse 17, said Jesus carried his cross, he didn't have a flashback mm -hmm. to another son carrying wood. Or letter B, when John the Baptist introduced Jesus, behold the Lamb of God. There's the one caught in the bushes. Is he a lamb or is he a ram? Is it the son or the father who's suffering here? Oh my goodness, that, that's a good question. Who was hurting more on Mount Moriah, Abraham or Isaac? I can't imagine the father's heart. The knife hurts and is terrible in horror, but that only hurts for a little bit. Abraham was. See the loving relationship between the father and the son. Take Isaac, whom you love, as they work in unison. I think the point of the story is both Isaac figures it out at some point. I get it. I get it. And we're only two days into this three-day journey. I'm, I get it. And Isaac is cooperating. I don't think he had to fight him, to tie him. I think he said, oh, you better tie my hands, Dad. I might flinch. I don't know. But there, my picture is they're working together. Uh, is a profound picture into the triune purposes of God in the atonement worked out on the cross. The son is dying because the father said, this cup will not pass. You will drink it. And the son said, here I am. I'm with you. And, and, and I love quoting Eli Wiesel because he's not even a believer. I, I don't know, but I love his heart, and he's suffered, and he's Jewish. 
and he, he's a Jewish Holocaust survivor and author, writes with perhaps greater wisdom than he knows. This comes from a, a book uh, called Messengers of God. Where he's, but here's the quote. And so the father and the son, Abraham and Isaac, walked away together, the one to bind and the other to be bound, the one to slaughter and the other to be slaughtered, sharing the same allegiance to the same God, responding to the same call. The sacrifice was to be their joint offering. Father and son had never been so close. Uh, but better than Eli Wiesel, look at the words from the New Testament that help us understand how Mount Calvary and Mount Moriah go together. Let me just quote some verses and, you, and just see if it works. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, the son he loved, Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Or what about John 10, letter C, where Jesus says, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I'm no victim I give my life. Or what about this? Abba, Father. And the word Abba is like the word Daddy. It's a tender word. Abba, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Sir, here I am. Sir, yes, sir. Or Hebrews 5. Although he was a son, he learned obedience. All right, I've saved the best for last. Here's, this is good. Um, this comes from the book of Dennis Kinlaw, Lectures in Old Testament Theology. If you want a book that addresses your head and your heart at the same time, uh, this is my favorite. But he, I don't know whether he heard Henry Clay Morrison preach this, but he attributes this little ser sermon snippet to Henry Clay Morrison. And, but these are Dennis Kenlaw's words to describe the sermon. All right, and this is, we're done. The triune God was looking on at the sacrifice of Isaac. One member of the Godhead said to another, this is not the last time we're going to be on this mountain, is it? And the first person of the Blessed Trinity said, no. It'll be about 2,000 years, and we'll be back right here. And the second person of the Blessed Trinity said to the first, and when we come back next time, it's not going to be one of them on that altar, is it? And the first person of the Blessed Trinity said, no, when we come back the next time, it won't be one of them, it will be one of us. And then the second person of the Blessed Trinity said to the first, and when they put me on that altar of sacrifice, are you going to say, stop, don't touch the lad? And the father said, no, we never ask them to do in symbol what we haven't been willing to do in reality. That's... That's the God we worship. There's laughter over here going on. That's what it's supposed to be. Let me pray. Lord, this has been a, a rich moment to share with dear friends tonight. Thank you for Mount Moriah. Thank you for Father Abraham and his son Isaac. Thank you for the picture of what it means to be a father and what it means to be a son. And thank you that these are not just pictures 
that depict what happens on earth, thank you that they're a picture of what happens in heaven. Thank you for the Father and the Son and how they worked together. There was a lamb and there was a ram being sacrificed that made possible the redemption of the world. Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we worship you. And we pray that the faith and trust that Abraham modeled in just trusting you and your character that would be replicated in our own lives. And if there's any areas of unsurrendered life in us, or if there's any areas where we are resisting the will of the Father, we pray you'd bring us to that place of laughter, the glorious freedom of the sons of God. Thank you that you never ask us to do in symbol what you haven't first done in reality. Keep us in your care. Minister to us even as we sleep. In Jesus' name, amen.